Hey, it's Lisa Wimberger here. I'm the founder of Neurosculpting and I have helped thousands of people learn really powerful tools to regulate their minds and their bodies, including pro athletes, entrepreneurs, and those with serious stress-based illnesses. So I'm really excited to help you do the very same thing through education and some incredible guest experts. And together, we're going to discover the formula to unlock hope. So welcome. Hey, so we have Adele Bridges today. Um, and I'm going to read you a little bit of her bio and then I want to get into talking about the way she shows up in the world because that's really what caught my eye. Um, Adele is an international yoga teacher, health coach, and author who grew up in Mississippi. That's why you have a cute accent. Um, moved to the UK and wandered aimlessly until she found yoga. These are her words, not mine. Um, she spent two years traveling as a nomad, teaching yoga and continuing her training in mindfulness and movement. Uh, she is a self-proclaimed geek, as am I. Um, she applies her degree in psychology with her training in neurology of movement and splits her time between Florida and London, two places that couldn't be more um, opposite if they tried. Um, and she shares her love for the power of movement in her online community, movewithadele.com. But here's why, aside and in addition to all that, here's why I got really excited to talk to you today, Adele, is because I really, really appreciate the way you show up on social media. And, you know, you're I would I would call you an influencer and I would say that there are so 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 many people in the yoga world out there doing things but they don't all catch my eye and they don't all make me feel welcome and invited into a practice and um, and there's a very specific reason why I felt differently with your stuff um, and then we can get into the geeky stuff so welcome so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, yeah, I'm honored to be here. Yeah. So one of the things I really appreciate about anything and anybody in life is that if they can make me laugh or not take things so seriously, I'm in. I'm in because it's a, it's a, it's a door opener. And when I go to your Instagram page, that's what I feel. I feel the, you bring the silliness, you bring the, let's not take this so seriously. Um, you curate the most amazing soundtracks that completely represent the thing you want to teach. I don't even know where you find them, but they're amazing. Um, but you're bringing really complex movement to something that feels manageable. I, I'm not a yoga person, but I'm now on this movement journey myself. And I'm like, Wait, she makes me feel like maybe I could do that. So I would love for you to just speak a little bit about um, the way you show up on social media. Is that intentional? Is that was that crafted? Was that an expression of you? It takes courage to be comedic, I think. Oh gosh, well, uh, that's um, thank you. First of all, um, I it's it's interesting. It's always interesting, isn't it, to hear somebody else's perspective of you because mm -hmm. um i i wouldn't say i necessarily try to be comedic i try to be entertaining because i'm um i'm constantly aware of the the medium that i'm working with whenever i'm making a 15 second video or you know sometimes they're just like three or four seconds um and people are scrolling and they're you know they are just gonna use their thumb to keep swiping along if you don't catch them in the first second really and so um so entertaining um is is what i'm going for and if comedic is what the outcome is i'll take it because <laughs> who doesn't love a bit of comedy um and i mean i i guess to speak to the whole like not taking anything too seriously aspect i think that 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 is very much one of my big life philosophies when I was like, I think I was about 18. 
uh, I was assigned for an English class that I was taking to read this book, The Death of Ivan Ilyich by Leo Tolstoy. And it just changed my life because it's it's about a guy who it, the pretty much the entirety of the book is him lying on his deathbed. And as he's lying there dying, realizing that his days are limited, he's hearing the conversations of all of these so-called friends and colleagues that come to visit him um, to kind of pay their respects or whatever. And he's realizing that as soon as he's gone, he's going to be forgotten. Mm. And, and that nobody, he never really formed any true connections. Every person in his life is, it's just this very sort of, um, superficial and shallow kind of relationship and the reason being is because he always did everything that he was supposed to do he did well in school so that he could go to a good university he did well at university so that he could get uh, uh, the kind of job that his parents wanted him to get he did well in his career and he even married the the woman that um, his family expected him to marry rather than who he really loved um, and he even felt like his children didn't even know him and he didn't even know his children and and he was he's just having all of these realizations as he's dying mm. and reading that at the age that I read it I suppose it was just one of those things all the stars aligned it just it, it haunted me for months and I just I couldn't stop thinking about it and it just kind of created this habit that I have allowed to very much stay within my psyche of constantly thinking of everything through the lens of like, how much will this matter when I'm on my deathbed? Oh, well, how I'm going to interrupt this... for a second. How for freaking it. rare for that to happen to an 18 year old to have that perspective. Like people don't get that perspective till they're way older and mortality is knocking at their door. And you got this at 18. Yeah. 18 or 19. I think it, a big part of it was because I was, working for the family business of one of my my parents best friends um and so the the woman who i was working closely with just kind of helping out in their office she was my mother's best friend and she was almost like a second mother to me and she got cancer and she was she was actually dying oh. as i was kind of going through that. So it all kind of happened at once. So it was like, I think that might've been a big part of it, but that was also a big shift in my life is seeing like, okay, yeah, everything is truly finite, um, including our bodies. Did, was that before you became interested in yoga? Oh yeah. Yeah. Well before it. Okay. Yeah. So you have this amazing, um, mortality check mindset at a young age, which, you know, I have that mindset now, but I think it took me a lot longer to get there. And it took me um, experiencing some trauma to get there. So how incredible that you can get that from some synchronicities in life, plus the book you read. This is this is why I love literature. I was actually a lit major at one at one point, because these deep, deep thinkers and feelers that were able to so eloquently put pen to paper can invite us into worlds that completely change us. So you've got this mindset, right, of what do I want my life to be like when I'm on my deathbed cataloging it? Um, and so how has that driven what you do in the world? It's it's meant that I, I'm not averse to risks. I I will say yes to opportunities. I will, um, I'll try anything once. Um, and I mean, you know, it doesn't always work out. <laughs> like, there's some things I just look back and I'm like, what if I had said no? Hmm. <laughs> Where would that I be today if I had just easier. said no to that? <laughs> but um, for the most part, I think it's worked out well for me. It, you know, it's what led me to um, leave Mississippi and move to the UK when I was, when I was 19 um and just kind of start afresh on mm. a new continent really um and and just yeah like try and live each day as if it's not really as if it's my last I can't I would be lying I would be a complete hypocrite if I said that I did that because there's definitely days that I, I definitely don't do things that um I would do if it was my last day but just trying to make the most of every day. 
Amazing. Um, who do you, mm, not who do you want to be in the world, but who do you want to affect? What, what legacy do you want to leave with the work you're doing? Because right now the work you're doing is, you know, brain-based movement, which I do want to get into and geek out a little bit with you. But what do you hope the legacy is from that work? Because, you know, to be frank, there's a lot of yoga people out there. So what's your legacy in that world? I would just like to play my little part in inspiring people to move their bodies in whatever way that is. It doesn't have to be yoga. It could be dancing or just going for a walk or whatever, because I still, I, I see it all the time, um, evidence that people's attitude and belief around exercise or movement is, how can I avoid this? Mm. So I'll tell you an example. Um, the grocery store that I shop at um, is, it's, there's like a multi-level car park that you have to go into and then you um, can take the elevator, but I always just take the stairs. It's just two flights. I have a very capable body. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to take the stairs. And so uh, one day I was leaving the supermarket and that it's on the ground floor. You have to park two floors up. And so you take the stairs on your way out of the supermarket. So most people laden with their bags, they take the elevator, but I had, it was an, a lot of stuff. I was, you know, I was weighed down, but I was, I had it like I was good. And I had all these bags of shopping and I start going up the stairs. And one of the, the women that works at the store, she was like, Hey, you know that there's an elevator right here. You can take this. And, and I was like, Oh no, no, this is, this is my workout. Um, and she just looked at me like I was crazy. Like, why would you take the stairs when you can take the elevator? Mm. But I see it the, the other way. I'm like, why would you take the elevator when you can take the stairs? The free what facility. Had, yeah. What if you had no choice? But to take the the elevator because you were disabled, then I'm I feel like I mean I don't want to impose my beliefs on anybody else, but if I was in that position, I would want nothing more than to have use of my body in a way that would allow me to take the stairs again. So, um, but it's just I see that all over the place um, that people think of any kind of like exercise or movement that is in any way effortful as something to be avoided, and there's more and more and more research I think that's coming out that just shows how much exercise and it doesn't have to be exercise it could right. be just any kind of movement benefits us in every single way it's not just about building muscle or stretching to get flexible it's it helps you think better it helps you know even if you have a desk job where you just do it just using your mind it's going to help with that absolutely you know it's interesting because I, I think you bring up a really good point we are if we're so averse to exercise because we have gotten into this idea that that life is supposed to be convenient for us and i don't really know why we believe it's supposed to be um that's a little bit strange to me but we have free gym facilities everywhere they're called stairs and they're called sidewalks. And, um, you know, we, we have all of this and I don't see people walking in. I, I'm on the second floor in my building. I always take the stairs and there are people who will take the elevator one flight and, and they do seem very physically capable, you know? So for me, this idea that life should be more convenient is playing into our pervasive depression. It's playing into our obesity issues. It's playing into the fact that, you know, we've got the the most proliferate disease society on the planet when it comes to manageable diseases that can be managed with exercise. And And to your point, you don't have to go to the gym and be a bodybuilder to to get the kind of exercise that's going to boost the dopamine and stimulate the metabolism and all of these amazing things. I think I read that um, six to seven thousand steps a day is enough steps to to radically improve a predisposition to depression. And that's not an astronomical number when you think about it. it's maybe I think three and a half miles a day, even if you just took the stairs, you know, you're getting a lot of those in. Um, 
But I want to go to your approach to brain-based movements where we're talking about movement that is not out of fear, but out of comfort and safety. And to, I know what that means to me. That's why I'm all excited to talk to you about it. But what does that mean to you and to the people listening? What's brain-based movement? Okay. Oh, okay. So let me think of where to start. So I like to, um, I like to use the analogy of, of food, um, because who doesn't love food? Um, and you can think of like whatever kind of movement that you're doing, maybe, you know, you're already like going to a Pilates class, um, a couple of times a week, or you, you go cycling or whatever, whatever kind of movement you do, that's just like your average diet, like whatever foods that you're also eating. But most of us that care about being optimally healthy or trying to be optimally healthy, will usually take some sort of supplement. Maybe we take a multivitamin, maybe we take, um, you know, a magnesium or some sort of like green powder that we, um, mix into our smoothies or whatever it is, just to make sure that we've got all those little supplements that, you know, if anything's kind of falling through the crack with our diet, then we've got the supplements to back it up. And that's kind of how I see the, um, taking a brain-based approach because movement already is neurology. The reason that we have brains is because we move animals that don't have brains don't move i mean sorry creatures living things that don't have brains they they don't move that's why plants don't have nervous systems etc so um or they don't have brains uh, sorry, I, I love a, that i'm not I, a botanist no um, but i <laughs> love i want to highlight that because it's so important brains are designed for locomotion. Everything mm -hmm. about the brain and the nervous system is designed for locomotion and the discernment of when to move and when not to move, which is still an orientation towards movement. So I love that you just brought that out because it's our nature. It's it's our the fabric yeah. of who we are. Yeah, absolutely. And so so we are meant to move and um but obviously we live in this in this world where we have cars and elevators and um phones that where we can order food and have it delivered right to our door and all of this kind of stuff and so um so people's nervous systems because our nervous systems are constantly changing and adapting to the environment around us and so pe some people's nervous systems might have adapted to a, a world where they they don't move very much and so um just keeping in mind that every single person has a different nervous system based on what whatever behaviors and activities they've done throughout their entire life and what injuries or other traumas that they've had, et cetera, um, as well as their beliefs, whatever beliefs they hold. Um, and so, so you can't simply take a person who has spent most of their, their life being sedentary and stick them in a gym class and expect them to feel good afterwards. Um, or, or to give them some sort of protocol that you would give somebody that has been active their whole life and expect them to enjoy the feeling of that kind of exercise. Um, because for, for one person, a type of exercise that can be amazing might be actually a threat and feel really unsafe and and very uncomfortable for another person. Um, and so the, the brain-based approach is kind of like, instead of just taking, um, like having your food and then taking a, a general multivitamin, it's like maybe having your food, um, but maybe seeing a, a dietitian or getting like um, a gut test or something to figure out like more specifically, what does my body need right now to get all the nutrients that I need. And so that brain-based approach is using things that we know about the brain and different areas of the brain that target or that are um, that facilitate different types of movement or different reflexes that occur in the spinal cord to, um, to help people fine tune whatever it is that they need. Um, yeah, just kind of separate from the, the generalized like you need to get fit. So go to this yoga class or go to this Pilates class or whatever it is. I love that you meet people where they're at. This is this is how I'm interpreting it, right? You're going to meet people where they're at um, because each of our nervous systems has a bit habituated differently. Um, and I appreciate that because 
I just started my journey with the gym a couple of years ago. And to go in and to see people there in one particular way of like building muscle and sculpting their bodies and me coming off of a, a life of you know, dancing a lot, but never really working out and not really doing yoga and not feeling like I know what I'm doing at all with fitness. Um, to come in and expect to do what they did was a little bit overwhelming and intimidating, not to mention downright dangerous if I actually tried that protocol. So I had to scale way back and get someone who understood how to meet me where I was at. And what I love about you know, and you do this in your videos too on Instagram, you always give this playful way for people to, to do this their way and differently. And you're, you're, you're a strong proponent of, it doesn't have to look like this. Um, but what I love about that is that when I think about neuroplasticity and our ability to adapt and learn, if we're, if we're making those wins in small incremental doses, then we can stack those wins on each other and get more flexible, more capable, more endurance and more stamina and more conditioning versus um, I see this unattainable end result and I'm going to jump in hard and I'm going to hurt myself and I'm not going to catalog the wins. I'm not going to get the dopamine hits. I'm actually going to get hurt and then I'm going to have to be in recovery and I'm probably not going to go back to the gym. Uh, in, in a really healthy way. So um, tell me a little bit about the important parts and pieces of getting physically healthy. I know you, you have a fascination around helping people understand the importance of the visual system. So how is that playing in? Because I get so excited when I hear this kind of geeky stuff. Sure, yeah. So, well, I suppose the answer to that question um, I can, yeah, I can talk about the visual system, but I, I also just want to say like a big part of my, my sort of approach to movement is, um, is variety and novelty and getting people to do things that they don't normally do. Um, because not only is this really good for the brain just to kind of keep learning, like being back in that that place that we spend so much time as a kid where everything is new and we're constantly learning and so we're making mistakes but we get up and try again um kind of continuing that on because i think it's so important that we keep doing that um but also from that neuroplasticity mindset the way the neuroplasticity works is as you know is it doesn't you don't you're not just adapting and getting better at things as you do them more repetitively but you're also whatever you're not doing you're getting worse at exactly you're, so so if you just do the same movement over and over and over and over again and you're neglecting all the other types of movement that you're capable of then if life brings you to a point what you know whatever it might be the way you need to move in this different way to how you've been training then it's going to come with possibly some sort of threat and you know it doesn't necessarily mean injury it could mean injury but it could just mean that you know it, it it makes you just feel really dizzy or um or you feel fatigued or whatever um and so so i'm always trying to not just get the repetition of course repetition is great getting people allowing people to do things um a few times to get a feel for it and to build that neuroplasticity but also just to change it up and um i like to try and challenge people um like with their balance doing things that i know there's no way anybody's going to be able to not wobble or fall in this balance um just to get that kind of the the neuroplasticity of all of these different movements that we're capable of um, and not just in range of motion but also you know speed or how long you hold something or um, yeah how much weight you've got all of these different ways to kind of change up a movement um, but then moving into the visual system the same goes for the eyes because a lot of people don't think about this I know I didn't consider it until it was brought to my attention um, that our eyes move also thanks to muscles. And so the, the muscles that move your eyes like up and down and side to side are just like your muscles that bend and straighten your arm or 
you know, allow you to do your crunches or whatever. And again, because of our modern lifestyle, we're typically spending a huge majority of our time using our eye muscles to just simply look forward at something pretty close to us, i.e. a screen, right? Um, and so again, our eyes are these muscles that are not really um, being used in the, all of the ways that they're capable of being used. Um, so that's one of the big parts of it for me is simply just treating our eye muscles like every other muscle and getting people to look up and around and far away and close up and all of these things. But then also appreciating that the, um, the visual system is, it sits at the top of the neural hierarchy. So of all of the the things that your brain uses to interpret the world that you're in, so your, your hearing and your touch and your taste, um, your eyes are the most important. So your brain is always, if it gets differing information, your eyes are always going to believe what the, I mean, sorry, your brain is always going to believe what the eyes tell it over anything else because the, the eyes are the most important um, as far as your brain is concerned. And so using the visual system, um, we can actually help people move better because we have evolved over time. You know, it, it makes sense. If you, if you like, just turn your eyes to the right and look as hard to the right as you can, just notice your head will probably move to the right. And even if it doesn't, you're probably going to feel like it would, like you want to turn mm -hmm. your head to the right. And that's because that movement of the, the muscles that turn your eyeballs to the right are wired neurologically together with the muscles in your body that allow your head to rotate and then the rest of your body rotates. Absolutely. So there are these patterns in, in the nervous system of that, that match certain eye movements to certain body movements. And we can use those to help people move better. And that's just one example. It, it, it's a very deep and complex thing that I could talk for hours about. But I love <laughs> that because it, it's a, it is a physically postural orienting um, catalyst. I mean, that's what it's for, right? We, we move the eyes to move the head to orient the body to then discern if we should locomote or not, right? So it is the top of the chain of what you said earlier is like we're designed for movement. Um, and you all you already know this too, um, the visual field stores trauma. And so if we don't move the eyes through the whole visual field in ways that start to um, unwind that, right? If we start to just habituate to avoiding certain aspects of the visual field because maybe there's some trauma stored there, then we're also gonna limit the physical orientation towards that and we are going to limit our body our posture even the way the head stacks on the spinal column is is connected to how the eyes are moving us and to your point we're sitting and you know if we're sitting with a great posture we might be looking at a horizon line but generally that's not generally we're curled over heads down, necks crunched up, and eyes are looking in, I mean, we're in this torqued and cramped space. And I love that you bring the eyes into it because um, we don't ever really equate them to movement and exercise when we're in the gym. Uh, and there are balance mechanism, right? So, um, and anyone who's been on a boat and been motion sick knows this. If you, if the horizon line keeps changing, and your visual field is is marking that, you're going to physically get sick. Your body's going to be so vestibularly disturbed that you can't balance. Yeah. So even all the balance stuff that you do requires the eyes. You did a video the other um, day that I watched about being in handstand and banana position and that the banana mm -hmm. position was because the head and the eyes were looking in the wrong spot and the you made a correction of just head position and, and eye gaze and the whole arc of your handstand changed and i thought that was a great example of oh eyes are important here yeah um yeah absolutely so, so um 
you, we could talk for hours on the eyes, um, but I, I want in, in some of the time we have left, I want you to talk a little bit about hypermobility. Um, I have a very personal interest in this. My daughter is hypermobile and, um, and I think people assume mobility is great and people always are like proud to say weird things like I'm double jointed. I don't even know what that means, but they'll say that to mean they're extra flexible. But what's your relationship to hypermobility and movement? Tell me a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah, I, um, I realized I was hypermobile after teaching yoga for a couple of years and I happened to cross a, an article about hypermobility. And as I was reading it, I was like, well, dang, that's me. That's you. Um, <laughs> and that explains so much. And um, it's, um, it is like people, it is exactly how you say people hear hypermobility, I think often, and they think, they think two things. First of all, like, well, that's awesome. I would love to be flexible. And two, that it only means that you're flexible and that you're flexible everywhere. And those are big misconceptions because it's, um, I mean, it, it's what it is, is um, a condition that affects the structure of the collagen. And so, yes, it shows up as hyperflexibility in the joints. Um, but it also affects more than just the ligaments it, and, and, and skin and muscles and tendons. It also affects, you know, the lining of your gut and the lining of your blood vessels and, um, and all of these things. And, and as it, most anybody hopefully can appreciate, um, sorry, my computer's just decided to do some weird update. Okay. That's okay. Okay. Where was I? Um, yeah, everything in the body is connected. Everything, right? We know that now. We're beginning to appreciate that on a much higher scale. That um, you know, your your gut can affect your your brain and your mood and your um, you know what happens in like like what you were saying with the seasickness. You know that that sensory mismatch of like my my vestibular system is telling me one thing, but my eyes are telling me another, and now I feel sick. Like everything is connected, and so um, hypermobility because of this collagen structure making everything really stretchy and it's not just that it's extra stretchy the recoil of going back so if you imagine an elastic band you pull it you stretch it apart and it just pings right back to place and that's kind of more along how a normal collagen structure would would act but with hypermobile people it's like you get stretched out and then it just takes its time to recoil back to place um, and so that affects every system of the body. And so hypermobility often comes with gut issues, anxiety, the, these things lead to fatigue, insomnia, as well as incredible joint pain. Um, and also because of the way the body works, the body will always just try and do the action that you ask it to do. And so um, an example is if, if I, um, so for me, um, because my hypermobility shows up a lot in my knees and in my lower back. And, um, and so the, my body um, has compensated to try to hold some sort of shape um, by making my hips really stiff. So I don't have a huge amount of hip mobility, um, although it's changed a lot now because I've been working on this for years. Um, but if you were to go back and look at my, my photos from like when I very, very, very first started yoga, it's like my hips barely move and all of my movement is coming like from my low back if I'm doing a back bend. Um, and, um, and so I think I've slightly lost my train of thought here. So it's we were talking about the, the, how the hypermobility shows up and, and how it's yes. not just a positive. Exactly. Yeah. So, so it does come with some stiffness as well, because if, yeah, if I've got, if I'm asking my body to do a backbend, my body's going to go, okay, backbend, let's do it. But it's going to create tightness in some joints. And so that's another big misconception. People say, well, I'm not hypermobile because even though I've got like these, this joint and this joint and this joint and this joint all hyperextend, I'm really tight in these other joints. So I must not be quite hypermobile. And it's like, well, no, that's your body trying to protect you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so, so yeah. And, and then typically the other joints, the ones that do well, the joints that get really stiff as well as the joints that are hyper extending all the time, typically become really painful if you're not, yes. if you're not kind of training your body to, um, 
to move with more um, evenness, I guess. So um, what do you do to balance the hypermobility? What are some of the practices that you've developed that, because you're moving all the time, so you must have found a way to do it comfortably, safely, and in a non-overcompensating way. So what are you doing? Yeah, it's for me, the two biggest tools are mindfulness and strength training. So first of all, my yoga practice gave me the mindfulness. My yoga practice hurt me before I realized mm -hmm. um, how to kind of build strength training into it. Um, but I at least learned like how to move mindfully and just pay attention to like what is happening in my body as I'm moving through these shapes. And so having that awareness of what you're doing and moving intentionally um, to become aware of like, oh, okay, actually, yeah, my, my knees are like going well beyond 180 degrees. And that, you know, that's um, something that is worth being aware of and then building strength training into it. So um, I obviously work a lot with body weight being a yoga teacher and, and I love just body weight, but I, I know I have to get the weights out. I have to get the resistance bands out um, to, to just bring a lot of extra strength to the muscles around my joints just to yeah. protect them. I think that is so important. Um, you know, I remember my we discovered my daughter had uh, hypermobility EDS, you know, when she was very mm. young and all the all the symptoms you said and then some. Um, and I remember we take for granted it, if we're not hypermobile, we take for granted that what a body feels like. But I remember her walking up the stairs once she was probably I don't know, like 13 or 14 walking up the stairs and she just stopped and she said, Mom, does everybody feel wobbly and like they're going to fall over every time they walk up and down stairs. And I stopped and I said, No, she said, Well, I feel like that all my life. And this is this is what happens with hypermobile people, right is not just the not just the the physical effect of the collagen structure, but the then the internal sense of stability isn't mm -hmm. physically there. So now that plays into that anxiety of I don't even feel stable in my body. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, I think it's so, so important that people like you who don't just know about it, but live it are actually out there doing it in a healthy way. And I think that um, that's really, really important because they're, the people with EDS usually suffer silently. Yeah. Yeah, it's, and EDS is like uh, just, it's a much more sort of extreme because hypermobility, joint hypermobility is a spectrum. And right. EDS is kind of like the extreme. The extreme spectrum, spectrum. Yeah. yes, absolutely. And life is, yeah, it's just, um, yeah, just not feeling like all your joints are kind of like falling apart. And, um, yeah. and the, um, it's, it's a proprioception thing as well. Um, hypermobility, it affects the proprioception. So it's, it's almost like your your brain isn't able to kind of properly comprehend like where each joint is in space as well. And it's just, um, I think it's it's worth appreciating, like, like you said, like just how important that is, like how much harder it can be just to get through daily activities. And I mean, going up the stairs just, Going back to yeah. what we were talking about earlier, like using the stairs instead of the elevator, but I do want to just give a shout out to people who just can't maybe use the stairs, uh, and that's why they use the elevator. Um, but um, it's, it, yeah, it's one of those things that, like you said, it, they, it, the suffering is often silent because it's it's not like you can point to like this hurts, like, right. or you can say like this specific thing is wrong. It's just this kind of overall like feeling mm -hmm. of like, everything's just not quite right. Yeah. But there's so many, um, it's kind of, it, it's, it's kind of mind blowing. Like how many studies I've read where different symptoms of hypermobility and EDS are alleviated by strength training, 
even yes. things that you would think have nothing to do yes. with like the muscles themselves. Yes. But it's because we're, you know, everything is connected and it's like, like the anxiety and just that feeling of, of instability and that feeling of not being in control that can kind of like weigh on your, your self-esteem almost and your mm -hmm. self-worth and just the, the, the overall power that you feel you have as a person. Like if you're not feeling powerful in your body, then you, it can have an effect on your mood and all of that can change by strength training. Completely. Have you heard of the body braid? Do you know what that is? Um, oh. It's this really cool, it's like elastic braided suit. It's like- Oh like, yes, I have seen that. Yes. I'm, I'm really interested in getting one um, for my daughter, but it's this beautiful braided form like light, almost like lycra, and you can wear it over clothes or under clothes, and it just gently holds all of your joints so that you can move with a sense of stability, but have all the freedom and the flexibility. And um, I hear amazing things about it for, for people with hypermobility. Um, but mm -hmm. I know we're coming close to our time, and I feel like there's just so much more I could talk with you about in terms of movement yeah. and, and neuroscience. But what's one or two things that you could give right now to somebody who is not on the health workout fitness tip, feels like they can't do anything because they're sedentary. What's one or two things that you could give them now that helps them just start that process? I would say if, yeah, if, if you identify it like something like that and you want to start just with one simple thing to start feeling better is no matter what the weather is, um, start your day with a walk. Mm. Just go for a walk. Walking is the most natural thing that we humans can do. And if you do it early in the morning when the sun is coming up, you get that light in your eyes. It's so good for all of the sort of chemicals in the brain. Um, you're getting, so, so you, you know, it, it just, it's um, multifunctional. Um, but you don't even have to be aware of everything that's happening. Just go for a walk and feel the benefits yourself. Mm -hmm. um, even if it's if it's raining, if it's disgustingly hot and humid, if it's freezing cold, just go outside, dress properly, get that morning light in your eyes, get some movement. I love that. Um, I want to say the, the f few things that I picked up that I'm taking home with me. One, our days are limited, so make true connections. Uh, two, uh, say yes to more opportunities and don't be um, risk averse. Three, seize each opportunity to move within your spectrum of comfortable, safe movement. Four, movement is neurology. Five, variety and novelty will help prepare you for new kinds of movement when the time and need arise. And six, eyes move thanks to muscles and eyes then inspire the body and other muscles to move. So those were the things that really stood out to me. Um, all right, Adele, how do people cool. get more of you? Oh, uh, probably the, honestly, the best, the best way to just kind of see all of my offerings is to go to my Instagram page and then click the link in my bio because that's just got like all the different things. Like I've got a book on hypermobility, the, my, my uh, website, uh, membership website with where I upload two new classes every day. It's not just for hypermobile people, but as a hypermobile person, I am always doing things that are safe for hypermobile people. Um, and yeah, as well as just all the other like free things that I give away and all the just, yeah, everything there. So Instagram, link in bio. <laughs> Fantastic. It was such a pleasure. Oh, yes. thank you. Yeah. This and is, I, yeah, the time flew. <laughs> yes, I look forward to more. We'll have to do this again. Thank you so much, that. Adele. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks for listening to Unlock Hope. If you'd like to follow us on social media, we're at Neurosculpting Institute on Facebook, at Neurosculpting on Instagram. You can always reach out to us on our website, neurosculpting.com, and you can download our app, Neuropraxis. Stay well, everybody.